Welcome to the complete race overview for the High Elves, where we will quickly and concisely run through the race, simplify and then run through how to dominate Legendary without any cheese or exploits. These strategies are based on my hundreds of hours playing my signature faction in tandem with community feedback and personal testing of alternative playstyles. Note that each faction is subtly different, but the strategies and approaches discussed in this video will apply to all High Elf factions and the differences will be detailed in each Lord's personal guide following this video. So, who are the High Elves? Well, they're a bunch of scrawny narcissists who try to reach their ambitions without getting their hair messy. Well, you can probably see why I'm drawn to them. They are located on the island of Ulthwan with a game plan of securing the island from civil strife before venturing to the northwest corner to destroy the Dark Elves. They are considered the most vanilla faction, but their accessibility and high popularity puts them up with the Empire and Dwarves. Now to discuss the High Elf strengths, starting with Diplomacy. They have unique mechanics oriented around Diplomacy and are also liked by several strong races. They are also notorious for being very easy to confederate with in the early game. High Elves mostly enjoy a good economy oriented around trade, made stronger by acquiring new resources and finding new trade partners. The Spy Network's ability allows all High Elf factions to view the territory of any trade partners, so feel free to use influence and small gifts to fast track your agreements and trade income. On the battlefield they adopt a defensive playstyle oriented around archers and spearmen. Their early game variants perform very well even into the mid game and their late game options can handle almost all situations. They can achieve extra reach thanks to their large flying monstrous creatures and their lords and heroes give great buffs on the battlefield as well as on the campaign map. When assessing the High Elf weaknesses, they mostly draw from the fact they are physically weak, caring more about their nails than going to the gym, which means their hit points and strength are somewhat lacking. However, in reality, they are also expensive, but this allows them to wear armor and be highly trained, somewhat making up for this and giving them great line holding abilities. While this makes the Spearmen fantastic at holding the line, High Elves are typically very mediocre in dealing melee damage. Martial Prowess allows any unit over 50% health to gain an additional 2 melee attack and 12 melee defense. This is significant, so by design, Having more fragile units means they will not be able to maintain their martial prowess as long, again allowing High Elves to function better as defensive infantry. However, this isn't really an issue because your archers are the main form of damage. They also lack artillery options, but again they have large flying monstrous creatures to get around this. And this highlights the reason why this faction is so strong, is that for every downfall it has, it has a means of overcoming it. There are six high elf factions to choose from. The strongest being the ones that start in Ulthuan and the others getting more and more challenging the further you get from the island. Ranked in order of power, number one, the strongest lord, is Tyrion from the Atain faction. He is the faction leader who can very quickly confederate all other lords by turn 30 and dominate economically. Very closely followed behind him and arguably better in some people's books is Avalorn led by Arlariel a defensive caster with some unique forest units and specializing in the mighty Sisters of Avalorn and Handmaidens. Next we have Ivress led by Altharion, a dynamic warrior mage with additional units and fortifications exclusive to him, and he can also capture and torture enemy lords. Just over the other side of the ocean, we have our first lord in foreign territory, the powerful Nagarith led by Alith Anar, a roguelike archer specializing in ambushing and assassination. He is close enough to Ulthwan to be supported and confederate the rest of his comrades relatively early, but he is on the front line against the Dark Elves. On a far island in the south, we have the Order of Lawmasters led by Teclas, a very powerful offensive caster who specializes in mages and magic, but must navigate a slow and diplomatic trying early game. Last and certainly not least, because all high elf factions are strong, is my favorite, the Knights of Kalidor led by Imric, a warrior knight specializing in dragons, wandering the greenskin wastelands on a mission to obtain more dragons in one of the most hostile areas in the entire game. 
Even if you start as one of the long-distance lords, your goal for strategic overview and expansion will be roughly the same. You will aim to confederate and unite Althorn under High Elf control at least at some point. Just remember to try and control the inside of the Donar first, using the well-fortified gates to protect the interior. This also means the AI factions can battle the Dark Elves from the north freeing you up to deal with the cult of pleasure in the west. Alariel is incredibly easy and a great first stop to uniting Althwan. I don't recommend allying with Illyrian because they will drag you into the war with Marathi, but don't attack him either because his forces are much better spent on holding her back. So if you do decide to attack someone in the Donut, go for Safri as Avres tend to hate them and this will help build that relationship. Yvres on the eastern coast can be a bit hostile towards you, but throwing three to six small gifts at him with some influence will get you on the track to having Eltharion be under your control. The Cult of Pleasure led by Marathi will typically lead the first assault against Ulthwan and can wreck the island if you don't curtail her. Assist or confederate Alithanar to take her city of Quintex which will defang her and secure a foothold in the west. From here you can expand south into the Lizardman lands, or you could secure relations and head straight for Malekith. Alternatively you can bunker down, waiting for Chaos to arrive from his north and strike when he is preoccupied. Try to avoid contact with Norska in the north and avoid conflict with the humans in the east because they make great trading partners. Long distance lords like Imric and Teclis have no immediate need to get to Althwan, so don't try to confederate into there until you're ready to do so, but keep in mind once you do, the aforementioned challenges will be yours to inherit. For example, Imric has no victory conditions in Othwan, so he is often better off ignoring it altogether and focusing on the southern realms, and then maybe eventually working up there once he's ready. On the topic of diplomacy and confederation, if you want Imric early, confederate Kalidor, and then you will have visibility of the Knights of Kalidor, and you can confederate Imric II, so please see the video in the description of how to easily do this with Tyrion before turn 10. Being a proud king, Tyrion is notoriously difficult to confederate, and in some cases is more useful to have as a military ally. Please see my advanced diplomacy guide on tips to do this, but essentially if you want to confederate him, lots of small gifts, intrigue, not allying with him and just waiting until he loses his army and even then it'll probably take a boatload of gold. The primary race mechanic for the High Elves is influence and honestly it is probably the most underrated mechanic in the entire game. It has two functions. The first is intrigue at the court, and that allows you to bolster relations with a friendly faction for a quick confederation, or it could boost those sketchy lizardmen's opinion of you to keep you at a healthy level, avoid war, and even get a trade treaty signed. You can also use it on your enemies to turn them against each other, or even ruin Malachith's opinion of his mother to slow or even stop their confederations. The second function is to allow the hiring of better lords and heroes. Because confederation is so easy with the High Elves, you won't really need to hire many non-legendary lords, but heroes in particular have particular traits that are very, very strong. Whenever you win a battle, Unless you need the replenishment, opt to ransom the captives for gold and influence. Influence can also be gained by nobles by stealing from settlements. By using the specialist skill to decrease the cost and leveling up the steal influence ability, a noble can steal 5 influence per turn. In addition to the standard stances, the High Elves also have access to Liliath's Blessing, which foregoes some campaign movement for increased casting power, but more importantly a 20% buff to spell caster experience, most useful as a means of leveling up your caster lords and any embedded heroes while they are simply waiting around. They gain this stance at the cost of losing access to the raiding stance. Lastly on stances, High Elves are very susceptible to being ambushed. Investing in the wary skill, if possible, is highly recommended to increase your ambush defense. Using the Creation Scout follower and consistently staying in ambush stance will give you the ambusher trait, each of these increasing your ambush defense and protection from Skaven. Each High Elf faction can perform rites called invocations. While these vary between the different factions, every faction has access to the Invocation of Vol, which boosts elite infantry, whilst allowing Vol's hammer, which means you can attack any walled settlement in one turn because this grants you Siege Attacker. So save this invocation for when you will be attacking walled settlements in the early game without needing to hire Siege equipment or artillery.
All factions also have access to the Invocation of Assyrian, which grants 2 influence per turn, minus 15% construction and plus 4 to public order in all provinces, making this fantastic to use to stabilize new conquests and confederations. The Invocation of Isha makes you immune to attrition, allowing you to enter the Cult of Pleasure's corrupt domains, the Tomb King Deserts, or the Norskin Wastes without taking army losses, plus 10 untainted to all provinces will help stabilize your public order and empire. In addition to these, most factions have a specific right which either bolsters one of their unique specific mechanics or is a straight up experience boost for the units that they are built around. In summary, all of these rights are potentially quite good and are generally worth using once they become available. Now for tiers and campaign progression. My format's going to be a bit different to most others out there. Instead of rambling through all the different unit types, I'm going to start at tier 1, the options available there, and work my way up the tiers as the story, i.e. our campaign, will progress, as well as more advanced strategies to employ at these particular times. I would just like to caveat here, just because units aren't listed here doesn't mean that they are bad. This is simply trying to detail the most useful and powerful method of unlocking new technologies and accessing the units that will give you the best advantage in battle sooner. So you get your hands on a brand new province with a capital and several minor settlements. Well first thing in your capital you should have the entertainment building line because this goes up to tier 5 and alone can typically settle your public order issues. You shouldn't need these in minor provinces unless you're suffering from poor climate conditions or rapidly need to stabilize the situation. More provinces instead should focus on growth, elven trinket makers, as well as any unique buildings or resource production buildings that will increase your trade. Once you've reached tier 4 or 5, knock down your growth buildings and replace them with either entertainment for the gold, or if there are ports in the province, definitely go for an embassy which will boost income as well as plus 2 passive influence. But going back to tier 1, your priorities should be increasing your income or increasing the growth of the province to get to those tasty tier 4 buildings. Once you reach tier 2, consider building an elven gardens. This allows you to hire your first noble. For some difficult campaigns like Imric, I even recommend building this structure to hire the noble and then demolishing the structure for resource building straight after. Though if you can afford to keep this building, keep it until tier 4 and upgrade it and this will increase your noble cap. Nobles are excellent in the early game, not just for providing influence, but they also provide a strong frontline offensive infantryman, something the high elves seriously lack. And to boot, they also increase your army replenishment which is very useful on legendary difficulty. Just remember when you level your noble up, make sure you focus on replenishment, melee defense, and do not put him on the eagle mount. He is far more valuable on the ground, holding the line, than being on a mediocre flying monster. Again, keep him on foot, I promise you it's worth it. Just keep investing in melee defense, armor, and be sure to increase his skills so he can steal influence in between battles. The moment your capital reaches tier 3, your first stop simply must be a mage tower. This structure allows you to unlock some seriously strong upgrades for your infantry and archers, but more importantly unlocks recruitment of the mage, in particular the fire mage which has access to a sun dragon mount at level 22. Many players prefer not to use dragons, but in my opinion it is the strongest unit the high elves can field when not including legendary lords. Putting the helm of Cain on her makes her unbreakable and I have seen her be able to eliminate multiple armies all by herself. Leveling her up is relatively straightforward, prioritizing Burning Head and Kindle Flame to deal the majority of your damage, but at level 7, be sure to put her on a steed. Having her mounted on a horse allows her to run up at the start of engagements, trash the enemy and come back to the safety of your army. I cannot stress how worthwhile this is because you will get more value out of her and she has more than enough skill points to fill her whole entire tree and more. Now that we've got to tier 3, I'm just going to quickly dispel some internet wisdom that surrounds Loth and Seaguard. While they are an effective unit in multiplayer, in campaign, 
They share the same upkeep as Sisters of Avalon, which will shortly replace them with a much better unit in melee and the added advantage of flaming armor-piercing missiles. Given you are paying the same cost for each of these, this makes the Lothan Seaguard redundant almost immediately and unable to claim back the massive outlay as it replaces your archers. Instead, keep your archers in your main army and then go straight to Sisters of Avalon once they are unlocked. By some stretch, the best tier 3 unit they have in my books is the Silver and Guard. This unit is able to outperform well into the late game simply because it has great armor, a shield, good melee defense, and charge defense against all, making it the best unit in the roster to protect your sisters of Avalon. You should never ever build the barracks or stable buildings. These occupy slots that are much better used on buildings that will generate you resources. Instead, confederate or conquer somebody else's province and then use their barracks and stable to hire your Silver and Guard and Illyrian Reavers and then demolish the structure in the subsequent turn. Just before we finish up with Tier 3, be sure to raise walls on your minor settlements that are in a precarious situation near your frontiers. Also, if you have any spare build slots, consider building the Woodlands tree line and having it upgraded ready to go to tier 4 once your main capital is upgraded. Just like for many other factions, tier 4 is the powerhouse tier for the High Elves. If you did upgrade your Woodlands to a tier 3 and can now upgrade it to tier 4, you now have access to the mighty Sisters of Avalon as well as Handmaidens. Sisters of Avalon are by far the most effective and flexible unit in the High Elf arsenal, and an army comprised mostly of them can shred armor and hold themselves in melee and can pretty much deal with most things. I recommend having at least two units of Silver and Guard on each flank, as well as heroes up the front to try and hold the line. Handmaidens are a ranged hero, so they don't fill the frontline infantry role as well as nobles, but they can still bolster replenishment as well as use an entangle ability to pin the enemy in place for target practice. Or alternatively, you can use the hawkish precision trait to increase armor piercing damage at close range. Moreover, they are excellent on the campaign map and can provide a global plus one public order as well as locally increasing growth to help power level your provinces. Upgrading your mage tower not only gives you access to a second mage but also gives you access to the Law Master of Hoeth. A Law Master standing next to your noble on the front line is a great addition. His first priority should be to obtain Earthblood to heal your characters and dragons. Even after the fight, he can bring your army up to being stronger than it was when you first started the fight, which is just hilarious. Once he has Earthblood, you can either continue down learning his spells, or start to bolster his melee defense and armor, just like you did with a noble so he never dies in melee combat. The fact that Lawmasters have access to Earthblood means you never need to actually hire a Life Mage in your army, meaning you can specialize your regular mages for fire magic and use other lords such as light, heavens or high magic for any archmage lords that you might hire. The workshop building line allows you to hire artillery as well as chariots which are decent but more importantly they bolster recruitment, meaning if you ever need to raise a powerful army in an emergency this is going to help. Once you reach tier 5, the primary goal is to use your new slots to build all the buildings missing needed to increase your recruitment cap for heroes, as well as constructing the buildings required for different research trees. If corruption has been an issue, you may have already built a shrine to deal with this. Upgrading it to tier 5 will unlock Phoenix Guard, the most elite anti-monster infantry in the High Elf roster. While a couple of units of this can help against monster heavy matchups, you will likely find yourself rarely hiring them because they can't compete with the affordability of the Shielded Silver and Guard, where just two to four units of them with some heroes is enough to protect your formation of Sisters of Avalon, who along with your mobile units will deal the majority of damage in your army. Though here you can also unlock the Arcane Phoenix, a unit viewed by many people as their strongest. Personally I opt for Star Dragons, so build a Dragon Keep if you haven't already, though strongly consider the buildings that will help unlock the various research trees, namely the Cultural Advancements Tree which offers a slew of great perks. Now finally on to research, 
Quite simply, the early game should focus on bolstering spearmen and archers, while the late game focuses more on economy and civil administration. Make your first stop archery prowess, spear wall and militia training to bolster the power of your core archers and spearmen. After your mage tower is constructed, you can access precise fletchings and a lithomar armor which will keep your base units relevant well into the mid-tiers. When the various resource buildings are upgraded to tier 3, a type of research unique to it may be unlocked. Some are very forgettable, but others can be fantastic, such as plus one public order and growth. A great way of speeding up your research and leveling up your mages at the same time is to utilize their steel research ability. Through technologies, you will soon be able to hire lords level seven or above. When this is the case, hire a lord, invest in increased tradables to increase your trade revenue, and then move over to Elven Researcher. Each Lord you do this with will increase your research rate by 15%. Before you disband this Lord, be sure to put a point in either dedicated to Mathlan or dedicated to Vol to increase further income. While you'll want to disband these Lords, your go-to Lord in the mid-game onwards will definitely be the Archmage, who can be buffed into a combat machine once you put them on their dragon with several good traits. If you're still not rolling in enough coin, you can always abuse the infamous Entrepreneur trait. Simply hire mages and handmaidens with this trait and put them in your most profitable province. This ability stacks and can get very cheesy, so I personally limit myself to one hero type with this trait per province, but otherwise go nuts. Other notable hero traits are Fecund with handmaidens and lawmasters to skyrocket growth, and the noble trait Emollient which provides a similar buff to public order. Nobles can also get conscientious to bolster the aforementioned character recruit levels and Frugal reduces army upkeep by a whopping 15%. Thank you, Imric. If you follow this advice, you should find yourself entering the mid to late game in a very strong position and able to control your engagements thanks to proper use of influence. If you're having trouble on the battlefield, please see my advanced battlefield tactics guide as well as my advanced diplomacy so you can further control your engagements. Personally, the High Elves are my favorite faction, and I've really enjoyed making this guide, so coming up soon will be faction focus on each of the High Elf Legendary Lords, starting with the most powerful, Tyrion. My name has been Ryder, and I really, really hope you have enjoyed the first in a series of race guides. Thank you so much for watching, and please consider giving this channel a subscribe. Thank you.